So I want to say welcome to all those online watching from all over the place and thankful for all the dads joining us online. All the dads in Berkeley Springs make some noise in Berkeley Springs for all the fathers there. We're excited about that. And I am, like in the past year, I'm not having a midlife crisis, all right? Like, if you have to tell yourself that, are you? having one, if you have to reassure yourself. I'm not having a midlife crisis, but I am in the past year starting to think a lot different. I am starting to crest one of the pinnacles of fatherhood. I've got kids graduating from college. I've got a kid getting married and, and my last kid will be, will be finishing high school this year. So I'm, I'm, I'm cresting the mountain. And when I get to the top, I'm going to stand up there for a little bit and go, ah, <laughs> but what it has done, it has caused me to think differently. Can I just encourage some of you dads out there? The season you're in now will not be the season that you stay in. What, what, is, what did you say earlier? The guy that won the smoker had nine kids. Did I hear that? Hey, bro, it won't be like this forever. <laughs> Just hang in there. Hang in there. And, and, and life changes and seasons change. And it causes us to think different in every season. And I want to talk to you about that today, about, about thinking different as a dad. And this is not going to be a, a dad bashing sermon. I don't like those. I think those are stupid. But I do want to encourage you. I, I have been thinking recently about, uh, well, let me preface it by saying this. I think I'm going to live a little while longer. I'm planning on it. Like people in my family live a long time comparatively. And, and so I'm planning on living. I think I got another 50 years in me, 45, 50, 50, 60 years. So I have started thinking about how do I want my grandkids to remember me? How do I want my great grandkids to remember me? How, when I get to the end, what I do every day determines how I'm remembered, the legacy I'm going to leave. And so I have a long history of of that in my family. And I want to be able to carry that, continue to carry that on. I can remember when my oldest daughter was born, my great grandfather stood in a church service and held her up like Mufasa. <laughs> he was 91 years old and prayed a prayer of dedication over her life. And, and I, I, I remember him for, for who he was and, so I'm starting to have those thoughts, like I still have time. And if you're sitting in this room today, dad, you still have time, you still have time. And we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. So this is going to be a different sermon. I'm going to warn you up front. It is going to be different from the, from the type of sermon I typically preach, but, um, I'm going to let you into a little window about what I'm thinking about in my life and, and, and the types of things that I, I want to make sure I'm doing and remember and some of them I haven't always done. Some I still don't do very well. Uh, but if you'll walk this journey with me, I hope to, I hope to encourage all of us. If you're still breathing in the morning, there's still time. Some might turn to a dad and say, there's still time. Yeah. Still time to clean those dishes. <laughs> Joshua chapter four, stand to your feet. <clears throat> Joshua chapter four, we're going to read a good, good portion of this chapter. And, uh, and I'm, I'm going to try to give you some insight on it a little bit, but it is going to be, I'm just warning you, we're going to talk about a list that, that I made. So, uh, say amen. If you're ready, amen. Joshua chapter four, we're starting verse one. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people from each tribe, a man and command them saying, take 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan from the very place where the priest feet stood firmly. 
and bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel whom he had appointed, whom he had appointed and a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded and took up the 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they had lodged and laid them down there. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests, the bearing of the ark of the covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. For the priests bearing the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. The people passed over in haste. And when all the people had finished passing over, the ark of the Lord and the priest passed over before the people, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the people of Israel. As Moses had told them about 40,000 ready for war passed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him, just as they had stood in awe of Moses, all the days of his life. And the Lord said to Joshua, command the priests bearing the ark of the testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, come up out of the Jordan. And when the priests bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan, the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up On dry ground, the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones where they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground for the Lord, your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for, for you until you passed over as the Lord, your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us as we passed until we passed over so that all the peoples of the earth, this earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord, your God forever. Father, we thank you so much. God is men. You've given us opportunity to leave a legacy. So we pray today, Lord, that as we look at a reminder of the good things you've done, Lord, that we'd we'd start picking up these type of rocks ourselves. Lord, we pray that you would change the way we think today. Make us more like you. We thank you for this opportunity. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And everyone said, Amen. amen. You may be seated. I'll be honest with you, if you read that Joshua chapter four, verses one through 24, it's a little confusing a little bit. It's like, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's in chronological order storytelling. Kind of, it kind of seems like watch a TV show right now that has flashbacks and and you're constantly trying to figure out like, oh, am I in a flashback? So Joshua's kind of telling this story back and forth kind of thing. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to give you an overview of what happened that day. So if you back up 40 some years before this happened, Israel was in, Israel was in slavery in Egypt. The whole, the whole people, God's people were in slavery in Egypt and God appointed a guy named Moses to get them out of slavery, to deliver them from slavery. Moses was a reluctant candidate, didn't want to do it, but God had picked him. And so God, through a series of miraculous events, uses Moses and and the people are released from Egyptian slavery. They they have a 
period of disobedience. And so there's a, the consequence for that disobedience is that they're going to not go into the land that God had promised them, but they're going to, they're going to stay outside of that area for 40 years, 40 years. Now God divinely directed them. God, God provided them. He did miracles. He did the whole nine yards for them over that course of 40 years. He provided food for them. He provided, provided water. It wasn't the wilderness like West Virginia, like mountains and, and, uh, and forest. It was different landscape. And God miraculously provided. You could back, go back. There was a thing called manna. It was like bread every day. And, and, and he just provided miraculously. Since their clothes didn't wear out. It, it, was, it was really unbelievable. So now Moses has died. And there's a guy named Joshua, his protege, that has now taken, taken over. God has made him the leader of his people. And, and now Joshua has the honor of leading people out of this era of wilderness into the land that God had promised them to their forefathers. The only problem is there's a river, a, a river called the Jordan River between them and the land they're supposed to inhabit. And God just so happened to pick the time of year where it was at full flood stage. You know, sometimes when God is getting ready to do something miraculous in our life, he causes you to be in a situation where you need the miraculous. It's funny how we pray for the miraculous, but we never want to have a circumstance where it requires it. Is that true? I believe God can heal, but I never want to be sick. I believe God can provide, but I never want to take the chance of having to figure that out. So here is the whole nation of Israel piled up in front of the Jordan River trying to figure out what to do. It's at flood stage. This is not Back Creek in August where you and your family could just walk through the middle of it and not have to worry about it. This is, this is flood stage. It's a reminiscent of the first time they left, the, the original time they left Egypt. If you go back in Exodus, you can find out that that the God's people came up against the Red Sea. The Egyptian army was behind them and God did a miraculous thing where, where Moses takes the staff and, they, and the Red Sea parts and everybody walks through on dry ground and then when the Egyptian army comes behind them, come on, you saw the Charlton Heston thing, didn't you? I mean, that's pretty accurate. Now, we're, in the, we're kind of in the same scenario in order to get to where God had promised them that they would inhabit the, the land that he was given them, they had to cross this Jordan River. So, so what happens is God tells Joshua very detailed instructions. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take the priests that are carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Now, if you're not sure what that is, it was a box, like a decent sized box with like carved angels. It was crazy. Indiana Jones, anybody? So, there, and it was very specific instructions on how to carry this thing. You weren't allowed to touch it. Priests had to carry it. Bad, had to be carried a certain way with poles, uh, run through the, the, the islets on the side of it. And, it. and it had very specific things in it. it had the law, the Ten Commandments. It had very specific things in it. And it was a representation of the presence of God with his people. So Joshua was instructed, take the priest and take the ark. Now, this was not some willy-nilly, like, yeah, just toss the box in the river. They carried it. And there's a specific way they had to carry it. And it, they're instructed to walk down into the river at flood stage. Now, could you imagine the first guy, the two guys that were the lucky suckers to be up front? Joshua says, hey, put the ark on your back, walk down into the river. You want us to put the presence of God on us and then walk us down the river on flood stage. Sure. <laughs> so they put the ark on them. The Bible says when they walk down in it, the river piles up upstream. Now, I don't know if you ever thought about this, if you've read this story before, but the town up from them hated the idea that they were crossing. Because yeah. the water didn't disappear. It said it piled up at the town upstream from them. 
So you can imagine the stories they're telling their kids. Them stinking Israelites crossed over the river and flooded your mom's house. <laughs> so they step in the water. As they're going down in the water, the water piles up and it creates a place for them, the, the nation to walk through. Now we know this is a pile of people because 40 from, from like two and a half tribes, 40,000 men ready for combat walk through there. That's just the fighting guys from two and a half tribes. So there's 12 tribes of Israel. So we know there's a pile of people that have to walk through this thing. Now the way that's written, it's kind of back and forth, back and forth. So here's what happens. They step down in the water. The water piles up. God tells Joshua, take one person from every tribe. And they had a certain way they got in line. They had a certain way they traveled over this 40 years. They had learned how to do this. Certain way they traveled according to tribe. And he said, listen, when you, I want you to appoint one, per, one man from every tribe to when they get down into the bottom of the river, I want them to pick up a stone representing that tribe. Now, he didn't say pick up a pebble. If you go back and read it, it said pick up a stone onto your shoulder. This would have been a, a sizable stone, river stone at the bottom of the Jordan River. There was no scuba gear back then. Nobody was diving for river stones. This would have been an anomaly outside of the river. So it's dry now. So, so the first tribe goes through. My job, I'm going to pick up a stone out of the bottom of the river, shoulder it, and walk up on the other side of the river. And I'm going to, I'm going to that's the stone for my tribe. Twelve times this happens. The Bible says that after everybody had passed through, the priests then step up out of the Jordan River with the, with the Ark of the Covenant and the water goes back to flood stage. Now it says they stay in a, they stay in a place called Gilgal because their next, the thing they're going to do next is they're going to fight at Jericho. They're going to fight at Jericho. That's why 40,000 from those two and a half tribes had come through ready to fight. Because their next thing is they're going to take the city of Jericho. And some of you know the story where they marched around Jericho, marched around Jericho. Doesn't seem like a really good war strategy, but you march around it enough and God knocked the walls down with a big shout and Israel defeats Jericho. God tells Joshua, you take those stones and when you get to Gilgal, where you're going to sleep tonight, you set them up. You stack those stones up as a reminder to everybody that comes through here, and specifically your kids' kids. He was saying the people that will not know you and who didn't cross over this river. So here's the issue. Watch this. The people that had crossed over the Red Sea over 40 years ago, that generation had died away. And so now there's a new generation crossing over their river the same way. And God is saying, listen, I want you to set up these stones because your kids' kids are going to be born in the promised land where it's pretty nice. And I want them to be able to point back to a time that they didn't experience. And you tell them these stones are a reminder of how good God was to us. And then we walked across this river on dry ground. So when your, when your grandkids, when your kids take your grandkids on vacation, they could come to Gilgal and show them the stones in the springtime when the river's at flood stage and say, hey boy, your granddaddy, granddaddy, walk through this river on dry ground. And the kids will be like, nah. <laughs> yeah, they did. Because those weren't just any stones they stacked up. They were river stones. How did smooth, polished river stones get that far out? How did they? 
It wasn't like you could go to your local nursery and just get river stones to pile up around your house that's not near the river. It was, it was a sign of a miraculous event. Here's proof that something unbelievable happened. And so, son, listen, I'm telling you, you didn't even know your granddad. You didn't know your great granddad, but this is what happened. This is what God did in their presence. So I started thinking about, uh, told you I've been thinking different. We're teaching uh, financial, financial peace legacy um, connect group on Sunday nights and it's causing me to start thinking different about what we're going to leave. Not, not what we're going to consume, but what we're going to leave. I start thinking about that. I got three kids. Can I leave them enough to fight over? <laughs> when I'm long gone, and by the way, there will come a day where no one remembers my name. This is the story of life. But when I'm gone, will there be enough stones pulled out of the river of my life about God's goodness to me that when people walk by, they go, oh, that was a guy you never met. But there's a memorial to God. And so this is going to be a little different. I just, I just made a list. I just made a list about some stones that I, I think I'm, I'm picking up and some stones that I want to pick up. So this is going to be a hate-free zone. This is not a, you're a terrible dad. This is, this is a story more of me, and hopefully you can, you can relate to it a little bit, but this is... This is me walking through the middle of the river going, I want to pick up that stone and carry it to the other side. I want to pick up that one. And that, so there's 12, there's 12 stones I writ, wrote down that I'd like to pick up and carry to the other side. You ready? Here we go. The first stone is a stone of faith. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. I started figuring out that my kids need to see me becoming more like Jesus. The Bible is explicit that we don't work for salvation. You're not going to get up tomorrow and do a bunch of good things and God's going to go, you did it. You got in. No, we know that it's not, it's not works. We'll read that scripture there. It's not what I do that causes me to be saved. It's the grace of God. It's that he loved me so much that even when I was unsavable, he decided to send Jesus. And so I'm saved by his grace, but I become more like him. That's a different story. So I'm not working to be saved. Paul is not saying work out to be saved, he's saying, work out your salvation. So it's after you're saved, this whole, we call it this fancy word called sanctification, becoming more like Jesus and sinning less. So I started thinking, my kids need to see me sin less. Not sinless, <laughs> that ain't gonna happen, but sinning less. Amen? You know what's important? Look, I'm not, if you're a dad in here, I'm not saying air your dirty laundry, all of it to your kids. Please don't do that. But it is important that for them to know I'm not perfect and that I mess it up and that I'm on the same path that they are trying to become more like my Savior. And, and we're going to get into the other aspect of that, but this, but this part of me that's as human as they are, man, I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I can lose my temper, I can, I can say dumb stuff and I can, and I can forget things and uh, uh, like stuff I shouldn't do as a dad. But if they see me trying to be more like Jesus, I wanna pick up the stone of working it out in front of them. Hey listen, I didn't get that right yesterday but I'm trying to be more like Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm making the effort 
And so I want them to have a foundation of faith where they see me working it out with him. They see me, my faith increasing. They, they see it. They see a product of my faith. Amen. So I'm going to pick up the stone of faith. The second one is I'm going to pick up the stone of family. Ephesians chapter five, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the word, water with the word, so that he may present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. I want my kids to know I love their mother more than them. Yeah, you're leaving. She ain't. That's a good strategy. Right? She's my wife. You're not going to talk to her like that. She's my wife. You're going to do, what her, you're going to do whatever she says because I do. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 is the hardest verse in scripture for husband. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. I want my kids to see that their mom is so important to me. That when they when they get the joy of being married, they know what it's like. They know what it is to put your family first. I'm not saying I've always been good at that. I like working and that's been an Achilles heel of mine, but I want them to know what their mother means to me. I want to complain about her all the time. I didn't say never, I just said all the time. <laughs> I want them to know that I picked her and that we're together and that family is an important thing. I want them to know that nothing gets in between us. I want them to know that, that no person and no thing is going to separate us. I want them, to, I, I want them at the end of, end of my life to see, have seen me carry that stone out of the river and stack it up on the other side. How important that is. Here's what I've, no, here's what I've realized. I wish, I wish I would have known this earlier. I realize now that everything I do is teaching somebody else. Everything. When somebody gets sideways with me. How I respond to is teaching my kids. When, when, when somebody else messes up, how I respond is teaching my kids. When me and my wife aren't getting along, at the, and, and how I respond to her is teaching my kids. And I want them to know that I'm picking this stone up. The third stone, work. Now we're getting to something. Colossians chapter three, verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord, you receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. L listen to me on this. A good work ethic is God honoring. It's God honoring. His fathers were setting the standard of what it looks like to work for the Lord and not men, to work hard for God. So here's what I realized. A good work ethic doesn't look like this. Work hard, come home, complain. 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 Because here's what I realized. The things that I complain about, my kids don't want to do. Oh, man. We became business owners about seven and a half years ago, and we complained about it for five years. And they went, I'll never do that. And I remember the first time I heard that come out of their mouth, I thought, mm, I'd rather you work for yourself, somebody else. But the way I had portrayed it at the time sounded like a big pain in that area. <laughs> so a work ethic is not work hard just complain about it, work hard, complain about it. It's working hard and being thankful that I get to do it for God because if I was doing it for that jerk, I'd already quit. Yeah. 
So that means I can transcend whether I get along with the people at work or not, because I'm not doing it for that. I'm doing it for him because he says he's the one I inherit the reward from. And so I can go to work, put my head down and just be a great employee or a great boss or a great business owner. And then come home and show my kids, man, God put us on the earth to accomplish some stuff and not all of it is going to be easy and you're not going to like all of it. It's crazy to think that we're going to like every day of working. It's not going to happen. But if I'm working for him, his grace is sufficient, isn't it? Amen. So I'm going to pick up that stone of work, teach them. I want them to remember me as somebody that worked hard. This number four, I don't think, I don't think I'm good at it. I'm going to just be honest, but I've been thinking about it lately. And that's a stone of passion. I am, for the most part, a very emotionless person. My kids can count on their hands, one hand, the number of times they've seen me cry, and I would debate that with them. <laughs> I said, those aren't tears. That's just something coming. I've got poor, poor functioning eye, eye ducks, whatever they are. Just, <laughs> so that, that's, I'm just barely... It's a drop or two. I wouldn't call it crying. I remember the first time, I don't know where, I, we were at the dinner table or something and something happened and one of my kids was like, are you crying? Go to your room. I'm not talking about this. I read the psalmist, Psalm 84 too. Listen to this. Listen to the passion in his voice. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy in the living God, to the living God. I want to be someone that stirs up passion in my kids' lives. That I pick up at the bottom of the river the stone of passion and take it out. I haven't always been good at that. I'm straight faced a lot of times. I'm not emotional. I don't, I don't like, I don't like everybody crying. It makes me feel weird. But I want my kids to know it's all right to be passionate. My soul faints for God. I want to pick up the stone of passion in the middle of the river. All right, the fifth thing, grace. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own thing or your own doing is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Okay. My family needs to see that I've received grace and that I know how to give it out. That the imperfect Chris has received ample amounts of grace to overcome that and to live with imperfection. And so if I've received it, that means I can give enough grace out to my family and friends for them not to have to be perfect. Amen? They need to see me extending it to them. We've all missed the mark. I need to live the example of when I'm weak, he is made strong. That his grace will be enough to get us through. And the dad doesn't always have the answer. There's enough grace for us. Because here's what I know about the, my kids. They are going to bump into some season of their life where nobody in the house has the answer. But there's enough grace. There's enough grace. And so I want my grandkids to see the stone of grace that I pull out of the river and stack up. And they look back and they go, hey, you know what? We don't know what to do right now, but there's the stone of grace that'll get us through. There's enough to see us through in this. The sixth one, forgiveness. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive the others their trespasses, neither will you, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I'm going to let them see that forgiveness will be quickly given and quickly received. Those are two different things. Quickly given and quickly received. We will not hold any grudges. I, I just thought about this the other day. 
I need to make sure the stories around my table are not stories of me being offended. Do you ever get around a dinner table and it's just like, well, I remember 20 years ago when that guy said something to me, I busted him in the lip. <laughs> and your five-year-old son's like, my daddy punched somebody. <laughs> yeah, and when I get his age, I'm gonna punch somebody. No, don't do that. Don't do that. And your dad's probably blowing a little smoke too. Yeah, that's what we do. He wasn't as big as he said he was. I started realizing if I'm sitting around the table telling old war stories about being offended, it's not proving that I've forgiven anybody. Are my kids hearing a heart of forgiveness from me? Are they hearing stories about how I've just forgotten about it? It wasn't a big deal. I made a bigger deal about it back then than it really was. And I can just work just the grace of God lets us forgive people and move on. Amen? The grace of God lets us forgive people and move on over and over and over again. I want to show them that when I stand in the middle of the river, I'm going to pick up that rock of forgiveness. So then when they come to something they don't think they can forgive, they can be reminded of someone who did. Just forgive people. By the way, there's a reward for forgiving people. You also will be forgiven. Man, it did sound pretty conditional, didn't it? If you will forgive people, your heavenly father will forgive you. I want to pick up that stone of forgiveness and set it up where people see it. All right, the seventh thing, generosity. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. How he himself said, everybody say it together. It is more blessed to than receive. I want to see them, I want them to see us live a good life and give a lot of stuff away. When it, well, my great grandkids, I want them to hear stories of how, how generosity impacted more people than they even realized. I want to pick up that rock of generosity out of the middle of the river. I want to be more generous the older I get, not less. Number eight, discipline. Finally, this isn't what you think. Hebrews chapter 12, verse five through 11. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when approved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respect them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time and it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I'm figuring out that I cannot reject discipline in my life and then expect my kids to accept it. Even at 45 years old, they need to be, see me accept discipline in my life. When the people that I've surrounded myself counsel me and say, hey, don't do that again. What's wrong with my kids knowing that? What's wrong with my kids seeing me accept godly discipline in my life as a pattern for how they should accept it? Next time they're smart mouth with you, just say, hey man, I've been smart mouth with the Lord. Discipline is part of all of our lives. It never stops. All right, now, now we're going to get into some stones that I'm not very good at. I started thinking about this the other day. Um, I am not known as a fun person. Now, now, let me say this. There's a difference between funny 
and fun. You can be funny sitting on a couch doing nothing. You can be funny and not fun at all. I've seen boring comedians that made me laugh. I spent the large portion of my kids growing up not knowing how to have fun. Just don't, I just, it's not in me. I don't know how to do it. I'm not like a spur of the moment. Let's go to the water park. I hate water parks. I don't like being around that many people in their bathing suit. Sliding all over the same surfaces. That's weird. You never thought about that? You never thought about that? Fun to me is work a lot of times. So I realize it's not too late. It's, not, it's never really too late that I can stop for a second, reach down and pick up another stone that I'm not even really that familiar with. You realize Matthew chapter 19 verse 14 says, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For, such, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Kids are fun. Kids know how to have fun. It's just in them. What should we do with the mud, dad? Nothing. Put it down. No, let's throw it everywhere. I just washed my truck. What should we do with the new truck, dad, that you just washed? We should drive it in a mud hole. That's fun. No. We need this thing to last. We worked hard for it. Just didn't know what fun looked like. On the Enneagram, one of my daughters is a seven. Go look up the Enneagram seven. I'm learning what fun looks like. I don't want to be remembered as a guy who didn't know how to have fun. If kids are fun by nature and Jesus said, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven, there's not going to be any fun killers in heaven. I realize that's an important thing I need to pick up. Come on, the band's going to come up. We're going to finish the last couple. The tenth one is adventure. I'm semi-adventurous. I will hop on a plane, go to a country I've never been before and not even blink about it. But I want to teach my kids how to take every season of life as an adventure. Adventure is not just hopping on a plane. It might mean going to a state park. It might mean hiking in your backyard. It might mean taking an adventure. It might be doing something that you've never done before. And not always saying, we're not going to do that. Joshua 4, chapter 4, verse 11 kind of capsulizes what just happened in the scripture we just read. It said the people people passed over in haste and when all the people had finished passing over the ark of the Lord and the priest passed over before the people. It was, can you imagine? God set up adventure in their life. Hey, I could get you to the promised land any way I wanted to, but I chose to walk you through a dry riverbed. That's adventurous. Hey, by the way, Adventure is dangerous sometimes. And I'm slowly learning that if we're going to be adventurous, we have to dial back on the safety. You can't wear a helmet everywhere. So I have to realize that if I'm going to let my kids, if I'm going to leave a legacy for my kids of adventurous, I can't be always weighing it against what's totally safe and what's not. Let's do it. Let's go see something new. Let's go to a place we've never been before. Let's like, next time God says something, let's just say yes. See where it takes us. The 11th one, patience. (laughs) All right, number 12, inheritance. See, I couldn't even do that. Like, like we got to finish. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love is patience. 
They're not going to get it right all the time. No one is. They're growing up right in front of us. Just be patient. I tend to start, I've started to think, I've, life is not as fragile as we think it is. Being patient a little bit longer is not going to kill anybody. Just being patient a little bit longer. It's what love is. It's patient. All right, number 12, stand to your feet. We've been walking through the legacy journey with a Dave Ramsey. And I'm realizing, I'm realizing that it's not just about what I consume, but it's what I, what I leave to the people behind me. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And Beth and I were just talking the other day. We were like, we could, we could change stuff for our kids. Now I'm planning on living a long time. But I could change, I could financially change things for generations to come. So I started, I started thinking, it's not about what I'm consuming in this life, it's about what I can leave for an inheritance when I'm gone, amen? So I wanna stop in the middle of the river and pick up the inheritance stone. I want to leave an inheritance to my kids' kids. I want to, I want to ch financially change their outlook on life. I want to do that. So that changes a little bit the way I do things now. So that's a little insight into 12 stones that I would pick up. I don't know, I don't know what stones you would pick up. Maybe you look down that list and you're like, I'm there. Make your own list. And, and let me say this. Men that are in this room that aren't dads yet or aren't even planning on being dads, I want you to listen to me. There's plenty of people out there that need you to still pick up a stone. We're, we're in a world of fatherless kids. And if there's, a, if there's a fatherless kid running around, you pick up a stone for them. And you stack it in a, a place your neighborhood can see it. You stack it in a place that where you work can see it. You just pick up the stone of patience and faith and grace and forgiveness. You just start picking them up all over the place and you just start stacking them. I don't care if you got kids of your own or not. Take a niece or a nephew or, or, a, or a family down the street. Get a, get a God kid. I don't even know what that means. Be a God parent and just say, hey, you know what? It's still worth me stacking up the stones. And here's what I believe. There's no one in this room where it's too late to do this. There's no man breathing right now in this room where it's too late. You can just reach down today and say, God, you know what? I'm going to spend a little time in this river picking this stone up. I'm going to stack it up on the other side. You've been so good to me. And I want to leave a legacy of how good you've been. Amen? Come on, could you lift your hands to the to the heavens. If there's a dad standing around you, maybe put a hand on his shoulder and maybe just pray a prayer of blessing. Say, Lord, give him courage. Give him courage to stack them up tall. Give him courage to pick up those rocks out of the bottom of that river. Give him courage to be forgiven. Give him courage to be fun. Give him courage to work hard. Give him courage to do it for a long time. Lord, Lord we just ask you for courage to be the men you've called us to be, to be the dads you've called us to be. And Lord, we want to stack these stone up, stones up, not for our glory, but for yours, as a remembrance of how good you've been to us. And we thank you for that. We thank you for that. Come on, can you lift your voice and sing this out? You can do He can do it in your life today. He can give you the ability to stack those stones. Come on, sing it out, church. 